Canada used to be a country known for general religious and ethnic tolerance, prosperity, maybe a little bit silly and hockey obsessed, but very nice people. It is now a land racked by religious and sectarian violence where no one seems to be getting along, everyone's in their groups, anti-Semitic, all different types of religious hate crimes and ethnic hate crimes are, are, are skyrocketing rapidly. Jewish community centers are being firebombed, you know, the media cared for 24 hours, they've stopped caring, Justin Trudeau never really cared. And how did we get here? Well, you can draw a through line between what happened in 2015 and the coming in of Justin Trudeau and their policies and where we are today. For the hundred years before Justin Trudeau, from Robert Borden to Stephen Harper, Canada was known as a diplomatic power. And our foreign policy was, you know, very non-isolationist, very involved in the world. And we used our credibility in all parts of the world to leverage better um, diplomatic and, and domestic conditions and trade conditions for our country, right? We had the, the general good approval of the Europeans, First World War, you know, we were the vanguard of the Allied Army and us and the Anzacs, um, you know, the Battle of Amez, Vimy Ridge, blah, 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 the Hundred Days. And then you have World War II, you know, Juno Beach, but also the liberation of the Netherlands. So very good relations in, in, in uh, Europe. Um, also, you know, have had very successful peacekeeping missions in the Middle East, starting at the Suez Canal crisis, negotiated by Borden, where, you know, they, uh, we found a solution that made both the Israelis and the Egyptians happy for 12 years. And, and this was Canada's reputation as being involved in the world and standing on Canadian values. But Canadian values stopped being a priority in 2015. Justin Trudeau came in and made us a post-nation state where there are no Canadian values. In fact, Canadian values are bad. We are settlers, colonialists. Um, we have no guiding moral principles, just ideological checkpoints, if you will, right? In 2015, when half the cabinet was made of women, even though they were like a quarter of, of, of the caucus, what was the answer? Well, because it's 2015. Not these women are super competent or whatever, but it's 2015, therefore half of this has to be women, even though one of them ended up being Melanie Jolie, whose claim to fame was being, I think she was heritage minister, and she built an $8 million ice skating rink in front of parliament that no one was allowed to skate on. <sighs> She's now foreign affairs minister. So there's, there's Canada's uh, chief of foreign affairs. So let's bring it here. Canada no longer has a policy position really on anything in terms of foreign affairs. This is why we're being ignored at the G20, because we're not taking a stand on our values or Western values. We're just vapidly saying, you know, the center-left technocratic establishment, jibbity-jabber, um, utopian nonsense of, you know, oh, we're gonna have a diversity committee, a climate change committee, a diversity climate change committee, a diverse climate change committee for diversing the climate of committees. Right, this is all we uh, put out there. So we're, we're, we're no longer involved in any of the treaties. We have um, our allies distrusting us. Uh, there's more stories of Chinese interference breaking where, uh, according to Sam Cooper, there's gonna, be, yeah, and, and he, he does claim that the American intelligence is interested where we have uh, politicians and academics and people of different high level influence um, being corrupted by the CCP here in Canada. So another thing that we had to talk about before a couple months ago that we lose focus on is, you know, the the corruption of our foreign policy department by hostile foreign actors. And foreign policy is domestic policy and domestic policy is foreign policy. This is something that um, we have forgotten a lot in Western civilization. You cannot extricate the two cleanly, right? Domestic policy, particularly energy is arguably your most important foreign policy decision. Because if Canada and America can better produce and create energy at a cheaper price, at a higher volume, and increase global supply, well, then you also have control over that global supply where you can leverage soft power um, and make sure that countries that are allied with you are reliant on you in, in mutual trade. And this takes them off reliance of your enemies vis-a-vis -vis the Islamic Republic of Iran or, or any other oil-rich, gas-rich, like Qatar. So these countries gain more diplomatic power because we decide to destroy our own energy industry because Greta or something. And this has foreign policy consequences. And it loses us, you know, it makes the world a less safe, less prosperous place. That's domestic policy, but it has major foreign policy. Just like you know, foreign policy decisions. What positions do you take on terrorism, extremism, uh, this, that, you know, Khalistan, the Tamil Tigers, uh, Hamas, uh, PIJ, all these things, right? Because if you then start to enable 
uh, and, and adopt this moral relativist worldview where there are no problems here or there, well, then you start to get people inside your own institutions fomenting the radical ideas of the countries and the ideologies that hate you. This then bleeds into your society and creates chaos and division on your streets, which hurts you domestically. What's a great example of this? Well, the liberal government hiring an anti-racism coordinator, uh, Leah Marouf, um, who wanted to shoot Jews in the head. Um, you know, white, he, 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 to be fair, it was white supremacist Jews, like Erwin Kotler, a very center one. Michael Geist also should be shot in the head. These are very normal mainstream people. But um, according to Marie Louvre, anyone who isn't a radical, anti-Israel, lunatic, fringe, anti-Semite Jew, like independent Jewish voices, where none of them are really Jewish. I met one of them. They're, they're not. Um, the, these are the only people he doesn't want to shoot in the head. And we paid, you know, half a million dollars of taxpayer money to teach uh, young activists to shoot people in the head um, if they are Jewish and believe that Israel has the right to exist or at least should not be destroyed or, or anything that isn't um, the extremist Hamas position. You know, even Pablo Rodriguez to now, they, they're denying knowing about him despite evidence because they know they can lie as much as they want and they have cover in the mainstream media. But again, let's go back to the fact that Canada is now a country where Jewish community centers are being firebombed and there are no serious repercussions. We're not trying to find out really who did this. Yes, the police are on it, but we all know within 48 hours, there will be no press conferences um, outside the police office. Listen, if it was, if this was an Islamic center that had a Molotov cocktail thrown at it, there would be media members for at least a couple of weeks outside the police department in the area demanding updates on the situation every, you know, every day or so. And it's just not that way with Jews. It wouldn't be that way with Hindus either. We have uh, Hindu temples now in Toronto. We had Surrey, we had Brampton. Now we have Toronto where Khalistanis are blocking uh, entrances to Hindu temples and harassing people there. Again, this has, uh, <laughs> this is direct consequences of the liberals and the NDP enabling people who hold extremist ideologies to gain power and influence in our government. It has consequences on our streets. People who possess radical ideologies, Islamism, Khalistanis, neo-Marxists, hardcore communists. Like you could say, I will throw other ones in there. Thank God ethno-nationalists have no representation in the Canadian government. But I wouldn't be surprised if uh, ethno-nationalists I, would, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if black or brown or any other non-white ethno-nationalist got a foothold in the liberal or NDP party because they've shown a, a propensity to make uh, deals with anyone who vote for them or give them money. It's, it's, it's another sad consequence of where we are now. So you have Canada where anti-Semitism and violence against Jews is out of control. We have these so-called pro-Palestine peaceful protests and they are peaceful protests and every one of these peaceful protests openly calls for genocide. I'm not even talking about from the river to the sea, which I have written about and you can see the, the genocidal etymology behind that phrase, but more blatantly like antifada, antifada, there is only one solution, antifada revolution. Open call to genocide like with, with with direct Holocaust imagery in it, like the only one solution, Antifada revolution, globalized Antifada. So we, we have we have laws that are not being applied equally, where you have the social fabric breaking down because for years, Islamists and communists have been on the forefront of trying to end free speech, have been trying to censor and manipulate um, the country through the use of hate speech laws and hate speech this and that. Um, and now that they are openly advocating for genocide of Jews, um, they want to become free speech absolutists in certain scenarios. So you see these people who are now uh, trying to hide behind the specter of freedom of speech um, to gain support on the political right who doesn't under from, from people who don't understand um, the intricacies here. I mean, as someone who's a free speech absolutist, open calls to genocide, or you know, you cannot say whatever you want with your words. This is a this is something that um, people who advocate for free speech uh, often deliberately misinterpret. Right? There there are crimes you can commit with your words. You could commit conspiracy. I can commit a conspiracy right now. I can plan, you know, publicly on this video, say, 
hey, listeners, we're going to meet at spot X on, you know, Monday, December, whatever. We are then going to go into this particular private business that supports an idea I don't like, and we're going to start to smash all the windows and this and this and that. Now, have I done anything there? No, but I'm con conspiracy to commit crime, right? Conspiracy to commit vandalism, arson, whatever it is. That's a crime with your words. I can harass someone. If I'm, you know, constantly just banging on my neighbor's doors, just shouting in, into their door like, you suck, you suck, this is criminal harassment. I'm using my words, but these are things, right? So I'm not saying, you know, from the river to the sea should be illegal. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you openly say, okay, Antifada revolution, there's one solution, like this is an outright call to genocide. So either we're going to apply the law equally, which means those people advocating for genocide have to face hate crimes and charges on, on this, or if we're gonna say we're gonna be an absolute free speech society and we, for God forbid, any anyone who supports Palestine goes to, goes to jail for, you know, firebombing a, a synagogue or anything, you know, then let's, let's take away the, the, the hate speech laws and even the playing field. So this is another thing where Canada is spiraling out of control because there is no equal law being applied on both sides. There, there's always a double standard in, in whatever scenario where those who fit in with establishment ideals are held to one standard and those who do not fit into establishment ideals are held to another standard. People can openly see this People see the fact that Palestinian activists are blocking railways, they're blocking highways, they're blocking infrastructure, they're calling for violence, they're vandalizing places, right? This is, you know, this is called a peaceful protest and allowed to just go on even though, again, you can protest, you can mark, watch down, mark down the street, you can't stop in front of a railway or a highway. Like, this is the standard, right? Compare that to how they treated the Freedom Convoy. And there you go, you have these double standards, you have a liberal government and an NDP government with no standards, uh, no love for Canadian values, and have completely taken the soul out of Canada, anything that made us uh, great, and it's caused um, societal decay. I mean, let's do the final example. There is a direct line uh, between Justin Trudeau saying he is committing genocide in what is happening right now and how people are treating Jews. This is a direct line. Um, Justin Trudeau has gone in front of the world and said he is a genocidal maniac, Canada is committing genocide, he's committing crimes against humanity. We all ignored him because again, I am a Justin Trudeau critic, I don't hide that, I do not think he's a genocidal lunatic, uh, even though he claims to be one. But this type of ideology where we can just call anything a genocide, things that are not a genocide, genocide, um, and use this sort of liberal, I wouldn't say liberal, this sort of neo-Marxist um, uh, talking game where Again, people in the Liberal and NDP parties will call themselves settlers in Canada. And this is the same rhetoric used to justify the rape and murder of Israelis. Um, you know, a nine-year-old girl was killed, and even though Tel Aviv was created on a pile of dust in, in 1909 by Jewish um, uh, Zionists, like, again, there was no Tel Aviv before anything. It was literally built out of nothing. Um, these, are still, um, these are still settlements. So that has justified the, the genocide against Jews and it will be used to undermine the safety and security of Canadians, calling us all settlers and illegal and, um, you know, uh, property rights will be uh, diminished. It, it doesn't end well here. All right, in other news, we have down in the States, a um, good friend of the show, Panun, is now a media celebrity. So you might remember Panu, who recently made headlines for threatening to blow up an Air India plane again. Uh, now, if you're wondering, uh, blowing up airplanes is against the law. Um, it is something Kalisanis have done before. This is the Air India bombing, and it is an act of terrorism. Um, I will also say it's a bad thing to do. Do not blow up a, a plane full of innocent people. It's an act of terrorism, and Panu threatened to do it again. And now there's a story claiming that um, the Indian government sent an assass assassination squad to take him out in the U.S. Um, these are the new allegations against India. But the more important thing here is why does the media turn every terrorist into a human rights activist? There are one. There's many. There there are many many Sikhs who are not Khalistani. Even in the Time article that covers it, they correctly point out that the Khalistani movement in the Punjab region has under 3% support there. So if you want to find a normal Sikh to talk to, 
you can find someone who's anti-Kalistan. Now, even if you want to find a Kalistani Sikh to prop up the Kalistan narrative to undermine India because whatever, can you at least find one who at least advocates for peaceful separation against India to, to, to at least reduce the level of gaslighting just a little bit? But no, we go to Panun, who's the head of Sikhs for Justice. So he's just coming off um, a couple weeks ago where he threatened to blow up another airplane. And they did bring this up to him in the article. He said, oh, you did make a threat. He's like, no, I didn't threaten to bomb. I threatened to boycott. Watch the tape. And it's not just that. He also openly supported October 7th. When October 7th and the Hamas attacks happened, Panun was very excited. He loved it, openly supported it, and advocated for Kalistanis to do an October 7th attack against India. This is what this man believes, yet he is propped up as a peace activist by Time Magazine. I, can, we, can we at least find someone who isn't the maximum crazy? But again, this is the problem with the discourse, because the mainstream media will take the most dangerous and fringe people, and as long as they support a narrative that goes along with the mainstream, in this case, it is that India bad, Modi bad, right wing, blah, 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 bad, then they will use literal terrorists, people who advocate for mass murder, people who saw women and children be violated so brutally that their pelvis bones were broken before they were burned to a crisp and say, I love this. We need to do more of this. This man's a peace activist. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And if you read the whole Times article, it's it's beyond insane. They 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 are so close to understanding the issue, but they they deliberately misinterpret it. For example, they go on about oh the what's the Palestine movement? It's a right for Sikhs to have self determination in India. Sikhs do have self determination in India. They do. Like that's that like this is where you need to make an important point about what self-determination is, okay? So the big hot button issue right now is, you know, Zionism, the right of Jewish people to self-determination in the land of Israel and more generally. Because prior to the mid-20th century, before the Holocaust, Jews didn't really have self-determination anywhere. They weren't, you know, didn't have the same, didn't have equal rights in pretty much any country they lived in. You saw how they were treated in Europe, right? Uh, you saw how they, I mean, the Islamic world, they were dimmies. Uh, nowhere were they allowed to just live where they wanted to live and have full rights as citizens everywhere. So, you know, the Zionist movement, which, again, if you look at the founding documents of Zionism, uh, Mandate for Palestine, Israel's independence, it clearly states self-determination for all within a Jewish homeland, including Arabs, Christians, Druze, and whatever. So in Israel, the Arab population there, the 1.5 million, does have self-determination. The Christian population does have self-determination. The Druze do have self-determination. They have full rights and full participation within the country. Conversely, in India, Sikhs have self-determination in India. Self-determination doesn't always mean you need a separate, you know, state for your own religious beliefs. That's not it. Sikhs have self-determination. They live all throughout India. They're doing quite well. They vote in elections. They gain political positions. Sikhs have even become Prime Minister of India. Sikhs have self-determination in India. Sikhs do not have self-determination in Pakistan. This is the difference. In Pakistan, Sikhs don't have full rights. A Sikh girl could be kidnapped by an Islamist, raped, and then forcibly converted to Islam. That is not full self-determination because they don't have full rights. But we are pretending that India is the problem where they don't have self-determination, even though they do have people in the highest positions of office all throughout the land, and the, 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 the alleged Punjabi Calif Calistani state they want to make it would be a majority Hindu country anyway, where if you read what Sikhs for Justice thinks about Calistan, if you look at what they actually believe Calistan, they believe, they believe it should be a place that only Sikhs should have political power, and even if their country would have majority Hindus, and even more Muslims than Sikhs in this country. So it's an absolute nonsense thing. None of this gets called out. And this is what makes things so much worse, is the mainstream media. If they had just 
had any reasonable centrist person asking or putting anything Panun said in any context, it would have blown up his entire narrative and it would have made the violence go down. But instead, they promote violent lunatics as peace activists, help them grow their platform and legitimize violence and hatred. And this is the same people who go on diversity committees and, and, and think Donald Trump is the most racist person in the entire world, but they don't care um, if, if, the, if their, you know, lies uh, hurt Sikhs or Hindus or Jews or anyone because all must be done for the narrative. Finally, in Canada, um, I, I do love this uh, most recent story. So Pierre Polyev, um, he has caused the apocalypse. The world is going to end. Um, hug your mother and father, you know, find time to, ki to play with your kids because we only have minutes, seconds, I don't know how much to live uh, because Pierre Polyev has done um, two things that, that are unforgivable and will uh, trigger cat cataclysm. One, he criticized a media member for being dishonest. Um, this is the end of the world. This is the end of the world. Um, how dare anyone criticize the media for lying? Uh, the media, which is taking 30,000 to 45,000 per person in subsidies from the Liberal government, uh, how dare they be criticized uh, by anyone? Um, a healthy democracy is one where people um, can put out uh, lies with impunity and even the most uh, minor challenges to people in the media um, are, 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 are signals of the end of time because we know in a healthy democracy there is never any conversation about ideals or values. So that's number one. Pierre Polyev has, has triggered the apocalypse there, but it gets even worse um, when you see what Pierre Polyev did to our environment minister, um, Stephanie Jabibliot, who I never say his name correctly because He's a crazy man, and Pierre Polyev called him a crazy environmental minister. And listen, um, I'm not sure if billions of people are going to die because of this, but probably trillions of people will die um, because of this. And Patty Hyju um, did another liberal cap minister correctly pointed out that um, trillions, maybe gajillions of people will die because um, no one will be able to get mental health training anymore because Pierre Polyev called someone crazy. Uh, which means everyone's going to die if they have the most slight depression or anxiety. Um, they will be scared to seek help. Um, and then I assume just lock themselves in their room um, and not eat or drink for a month uh, because Pierre Polyev called someone crazy. Um, this also makes him Donald Trump, which, as you know, is the worst thing that ever happened to the world. Um, it's like super Hitler times a million. And... I just want to say that, listen, I know we all thought we were going to die in five minutes because of COVID, um, but this is serious. Take this very seriously. Again, call your family. Uh, tell them you love them because we have minutes, seconds, at most an hour left to live um, after what Pierre Polyev did. Just listen to Patty Hyde show.